No, awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming to our talk. My name is Ashwin Kumar Uppala. I'm an, I am an associate program manager at GitHub. And with me, we have... Hey everyone, I'm Juanpa. I'm a senior program manager at the GitHub Education team. I do all things student developers. So if you know about like campus experts or a little bit of the student developer pack uh, and you have get any benefit from GitHub, most likely it has gone through our team. And uh, today we're talking about like AI and education, which as we were talking before we started is kind of like the topic right now in, in education. So before we start, um, I think there's no doubt that 2023 was the year of AI. We have no longer talks only about like AI and, and its impact in education, but we see like a lot of like new products and we see new services that are being created using AI as a fundamental resource for kind of like the way that they work. And especially now, for nowadays, we see like different ways that we are creating technology for AI from new hardware that has been created to optimize AI processing. But we also have seen a lot of new models and fine tuning. And at the end of the day, uh, in the last year, the number of conversations that our team has had with AI and education in multiple paths, like governments and teachers and students has been very wild. And we want to show a little bit more about what is going on there and what is kind of like the future paths that we're seeing that is happening. Particularly, we want to talk about something that has not been discussed a lot on uh, AI, which is the difference between like productivity and cognition. And if you see most of the presentations that big tech companies are having, you'll see kind of presentations like this, right? Like everyone is talking about the benefits on productivity and how this is gonna make you send emails faster, how you can make images, documents, or in the case of GitHub, how can you code faster? But there has not been a lot of conversation around the challenges that this is providing to education, unless you have gone to like the multiple education like conferences around, which is kind of like the main topic. But there's also another part, part here that is important to consider, which is that if you follow the PISA scores, uh, we had one PISA score in 2018, and now in 2022, this essentially men, uh, measures like students uh, different skills for students uh, in multiple topics. And if you compare 2018 to 2022, uh, it turns out that a lot of those scores have gone very, very low lately, meaning things like reading, math, and science were some of the most impacted scores on PISA. And there's multiple factors because of that, like that, that causes one of them being the pandemic, uh, which some of you might remember. Um, hopefully not, it's, it's not old yet. But on the other side, there's also kind of like the way that we reacted to the pandemic and this rapid change into online learning and how we moved everything from in-person learning into online. So the GitHub Education team decided to make a little bit of a, we, we wanted to bridge this gap that we were finding and we asked three questions. The first one is, what's the impact that AI is having on developers and how they learn new skills? We wanted to learn what are some of the changes in dynamics in the classroom that are happening and how these interactions are happening. And the third one is, how can you use AI to learn how to code? Uh, it's worth mentioning that research, though like AI and education research has been around for a very, very long time. We have dozens of papers around it. And specifically when we talk about AI and Gen AI in education, it's extremely new. Um, conference this year, I kind of like starting to post like more research and more results about best practices or the impact that AI is having on education. So we're still in a very early stage. If you study AI and education, you have a lot of work to go to, 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 to do there. Well, a quick show of hands. Um, how many of you in this room have used some form of AI assisted tool on your daily lives at work, anywhere? Copilot, ChatGPT, almost everyone, even I have one. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> have you ever felt like, oh, this is really solving my problem. I don't have to Google or Stack Overflow anymore. Sometimes you might have felt it's hallucinating. The problem is too complex. Maybe it's not giving me the answer like that. Or sometimes you might have felt you have asked a very specific question. It gave you a solution. It works, but I have no idea how it works, right? Now, since 2023, our opinions of AI has been like that. It's like the new kid in the block. When OpenAI publicly released ChatGPT, it led to a snowball effect of LLMs trying to be more accurate. And with that came some concerns. 
Well, our concerns was, hey, it's not super accurate, it's hallucinating, it's not being as realistic as we want, or I don't know if this email was written by a human or summarized by an AI, but there was a chronic concern among a bunch of professionals. Those professionals were educators and tutors. You see, there are guardrails and guidelines to AI when this was released, but there were no guidelines to how the learning model will be used if AI is used as a learning tool or how it impacts the learning curve of an individual. Now, since there are so many possibilities of how we can use AI as a learning tool, for now, I want to condense it into three specific parts and an analogy that we all can understand. Sports. Well, open source is another analogy all of us in the room can understand, but sports is equally exciting. Uh, now, in sports, for a player to perform really well, there are three ways to do so. Steroids, sneakers, or a coach. Now, before I move to the next slide, most of you nodded and understood that what is a healthy option? Which one is more harmful? Which one might have immediate effects? A similar spectrum of how AI can be looked at at a sports analogy is steroid sneaker and the coach model that we are explaining right now. Now, steroid, as the name says, gives you temporary immediate boost, but can have long detrimental effects. Sometimes it can even do more damage than your initial state was, right? A good example of that is being over-reliant to AI tool for your work. The sneakers give you temporary boost without doing any long-term damage, but they are only as good as, uh, as long as you're wearing, wearing them. A good example of that is maybe some of you are trying to understand a code base, trying to use that in, like you want to make modify a portion of your code, a portion of your problem, and you got the solution via AI, but you don't understand the whole context. You don't understand the entire file or what, what is happening behind the code or what is the logic happening in that case. Well, in that case, there's no harm being done, but there's no learning curve either. The third one is the coach model. Like a coach, a trained instructor provides long-term benefits and is self-sustainable in the longer run, but it may take, the effects take longer in time. It's harder to measure that. A really good example of how a coach model can be implemented to AI is already out there. Some of you may have heard about it. It's called CS50 AI. How many of you know or have heard about CS50? Some of you know. CS50 is a Harvard course. It's an introductory to CS programming course. For, uh, I took it myself when I was in college. Now, CS50 AI is pretty similar. It's a similar GPT-based AI tool, but the CS50 launched this couple of months ago after a lot of thoughts because how AI could be used in a part of a CS course. So what they did was they put certain guardrails on the topics that student can learn and the limits to what this AI can answer to certain types. For example, in this case, if I ask it to create a program to solve binary search, it will not give me the code. It will tell me things that I need to do so that I can create a program myself. Now, that is telling me the steps that I need to perform. Now, steps like these kind of alleviate that bottlenecks and also increases the thought process of students to improve the results that they have obtained. And that's just not coming from me. The core students who took CS50 themselves felt that AI as a tutor was like having a personal tutor that provides answer without any ego and judgment. And then you can ask the simplest of questions. You know, as a student myself, sometimes when I was in college, I felt like maybe this question is too dumb or maybe others know this answer and I should not ask that. Now, I can shamelessly ask that question to an AI and not feel bad about it. So what have we learned from this model? Well, the best practices, I can divide it into four statements right here from the uh, sneaker, steroid, and coach model. The first one is try it first. Use AI, think of AI as a tutor. Try to solve the problem on your own, and in case you get stuck, use the AI for guides, 
ask how to solve the problems. Studies have shown in this case right here that trying to solve the answer before directly answering, getting the solution has more accurate results and has more benefits when you are trying to learn. Uh, the graph on the right is based on a research in Kenya on une uneven impact of generative AI on entrepreneurial performance. Basically what it means is uh, researchers in Kenya took 640 participants who are entrepreneurs and tested them against, hey, a bunch of you will have access to AI via WhatsApp business and a bunch of you may, may have not. And then they try to study what happens if a sample set of folks try the AI, try their problems, try solving the problems first and the others who are trying it on themselves. And in this case, those who tried the problems first before asking the AI performed far better. And even if you are stuck, you can always ask for help. But the important part is what you are asking. Learning to ask the right questions from AI is far more important. Because you see these large language models learn from our conversation. They, have, they are context aware and they learn from our conversation. So the way you ask question can actually bias the answers that it generates. If I ask AI is tabs better, better than spaces, it might give me an answer thinking that I want to know that tabs are better than spaces. But if I ask Juan, that the reason is like, hey, I want to understand which one can I use for which scenario, right? So learning to ask the right question is super important. Uh, and the last thing and super, imp and super important and equally important is, well, the dependency on the tool. Try not to get over relied on it. Uh, multiple studies have shown that uh, participants who have relied too much, uh, oh, a part of the graph is chopped off in this case, but the, le the one on the left is, if you're using LLMs with simple tasks, it's, the graph goes up. So it's easy to perform simple tasks on LLM. But the chopped off part says, if the, comp the problem gets more complex, people who are sticking to traditional problem solving methods like you know, going to Google and then Stack Overflow and debugging on your own and then discussions have performed far better than directly relying on these tools. Uh, four best practices, try it yourself, ask for help if you are stuck, ask the right questions and don't rely or don't depend on the tool. Now, it's easy to implement as an individual, right? It's very easy for me to come to you and say, yeah, here are the four, four magical pieces and go use it. How do you scale this? That is where classroom comes in. How does this look like in the classroom, Iwan? Cool. So let's start with um, how does this look in the classroom? So I know we have a few educators here, and I hope that this is a little bit relatable to you. Um, but in essence, the way that we currently teach is following the SAGE model. The SAGE model has been the same for probably like before the Greeks. And in essence, is you have a group of people that are going through the same content at the same time, at the same pace. And this has worked really well for the past like few years. But what happens if you have students that are neurodivergent? What happens if you have students that are, I'm sorry, we, we skipped too fast. Okay. What happens if you have students that are neurodivergent or people that learn at different speeds? It's a little bit hard, and I don't know if you folks, especially students, have felt that where there are some classes that you're really good at, and sometimes the class goes really slow, and you get bored, you get distracted. On the other hand, you might have like the experience that a class is moving too fast, or you get distracted for a couple of seconds, and you completely lose a topic. So the current model, the problem that we have found, or that has been like studied for a long time, is that different speed and, and, and the adaptability of like classrooms are not there yet, especially for the way or the mechanisms that we use to teach. This is also a problem for teachers because the, the way that most uh, like, let's say like paid institutions or education system work is, we know you're gonna lose some students. So in order to make sure that we have like an, a specific number of students graduating every year, we would give you a, better a bigger classroom and that's a lot of extra work for the teacher because now they have to solve the same problem for even a bigger classroom and a bigger number of students. That makes like tracking an individual like follow up with, within like the teacher and the student a little bit harder and, um, the, and, and it, well, it's a little bit harder and, and it creates kind of like this sensation of being overwhelmed. If you are from the US, probably you know that we have like a crisis of getting teachers right now and especially it's not only because of the amount of work that this represents but also like a lot of public policy that has been around. 
So the near future architecture that we've seen has been implemented is one-to-one uh, -one with a copilot or with kind of like an AI. These essentially what happens is as a teacher, you can give uh, your curricula to an AI-like model. It learns about like the topic that you're giving that classroom and then you have an interface that people or students are able to interact with in order to make any questions that they have around the topic that you're teaching. This has uh, some additional benefits. For example, the first one is that as a teacher, you most likely get frequently asked questions, and these questions can be solved repeatedly by this AI. But it also allows students to make, as Ashwin mentioned, these questions that maybe you have been a little bit too scared to make, or you don't want to burden the teacher. So it has provided a, a great outcome or a great path for folks to make questions that they wouldn't be able to make otherwise. In fact, research has shown that students make 30% more questions by using these, uh, this model. And GitHub has something like this. Uh, we are experiment with, experimenting with LLM. So for example, if you're a teacher, you can upload your content to a repository, and then uh, we, we can provide, well, Copilot right now understands the context, and then you can use that Copilot in order to make these questions. And in the future, the idea is that you will be able to train based on each repository and a specific and personalized LLM or kind of like chat, Copilot chat version so that people can make questions to the repository. So the, the two benefits of that is that, first of all, the content is there, so your students can uh, take a look into it. But also, if they have more specific questions, they can use uh, this chat interface to make these questions. But then, um, what we, oh my god, okay, there we go. What, what we have been looking into is intelligent tutoring systems. This is kind of like what a lot of people have been talking about recently. And in essence, what this does is that it allows to have a tutor per like student. And what we mean by that is that it allows a thing called personalized education. And this is what we mentioned about the problems that we have found. So personalized education has three main components. The first one is path, so where you're currently at. The second one is speed or pace, how fast you can learn. And the third one is setting a destination. So the way that this works is you set up an initial assessment. If you're a teacher, probably you know because you, you kind of like assess your students in the first class and you're like, well, let's see where everyone is standing and then you take it from there. So just you set up where they're currently at, you set the destination, and then based on that, you can start defining a pace in which they can learn with the benefit that this is a little bit more scalable. So it's able to provide um, a different pace depending on how good the student is on this topic or, or how fast they, they learn about these topics. And this opens kind of like one of the, the most, uh, kind of like the dream scenario for a lot of like education system, which is, uh, I don't know if you know about Benjamin Bloom, Benjamin Bloom uh, created this great analysis called the Two Sigma um, problem. And the Two Sigma problem, in essence, uh, was on, on the purple color, you have uh, the, let's call it the, uh, the score that a student would achieve if they have conventional learning. This is normally a class of one up to 30 people, which I know for a lot of teachers here might be a very small classroom. And on the yellow side, you have uh, tutoring, one, like tutoring in, in a one-on-one -on -one basis, which I mean, it's great if you see like the, the majority of the students that are, were part of the tutoring one-on-one got considerable, considerably better results than those that were in conventional learning. And this is called a two sigma problem because of course, if you can think of one problem with this model is that we don't have enough teachers to teach everyone in a one-on-one -on -one mentorship. And the two sigma problem is two standard deviations. And what does that mean? So if you took uh, statistics or pro probability classes, that means that a student happens, like moves from the 50 percentile, so you learn, let's say like 50 percent, or you're in the middle, you move to the 98 percentile, which means you become an expert in the topic that is being discussed in the classroom. And what, what has made, uh, the, the results from that study were like three. The first one is that the, the reason why tutoring was so successful is that it's active, um, if you, we, we call it on a, in, in some like education and some like classes that we've given like the TV mode where you're just like sitting and someone is like telling you the facts and you're receiving the facts uh, and you become pass a, a passive learner. So you receive kind of like this content, but uh, with one-on-one -on -one mentoring is more active. So the process of learning is not a process of someone giving you the knowledge, it's a process of co-creation. The second one is it's adaptive, but depending on like the speed that you like and the topics that you're interested. And the third one is personalized, which we mentioned a bit before about 
not only setting up a destination and a path, but also being able to have a flexible pace for you to learn. And that is amazing. I know that sounds, uh, yeah, okay. That's amazing. Uh, but that's kind of like the first pace of what we're seeing can be implemented in the classroom and some of the experiments that are happening. The second model that is building on top of that is neuroscience brain-based systems. And this is where we start becoming a little bit more like weird with the way that we teach. Um, so probably, I don't know, do you? Well, that's a lot of terms, neurotransmitter. Well, let's simplify it. How many of you here have used Duolingo? Wow. I hope you are doing great on streaks. Uh, <laughs> OK. Yeah. Have you all ever felt like you have been manipulated by Duolingo in some sense? Yeah, lots of people nodded here. Uh, what, what's happening? There's some neurotransmitter behind it. So the idea behind Duolingo is that it, it uses dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, and endorphins to manipulate your behavior. So if you have ever felt that Duolingo or Duo is like guilt tripping you to take a class, it's not by, by any kind of like random chance. It's actually studied on the way that they can make you keep coming back and keep your streak growing. So the same thing happens, for example, with Codidex. Um, I was talking with Ashwin about this yesterday. Like, are we all familiar with what a Tamagotchi is? All right, so a Tamagotchi, because like, I see some, like, the youngers are just like, oh, what is that? Uh, I, felt, I, I feel less lonely because I, I felt very old when I was talking with Ashwin about this. Uh, a Tamagotchi, in essence, is like a virtual pet that you grow and it evolves and, and you take care of it. And Codidex, which is a platform that was born two years ago and recently has been like growing in popularity, they offer you a Tamagotchi for you to learn how to code. So if you continue to sign up for the page and you continue to learn how to code and do the assignments, your uh, pet starts evolving and growing and it looks really cool. But if you stop using the Tamagotchi or, or you stop uh, taking the classes or making the task, your pet dies and it's awful because you just like see like a paper of like, oh, your pet, your pet is dead and you feel very guilty. Also, I added like that pet to my GitHub profile page and now I just have like a dead pet there. Um, <laughs> so ideally, the, the whole goal of this is that we're able to use these very well known um, ways of treating behavior and, and working with people to not only use it for like social media or these games, but also to create systems of learning that are not only welcoming for more students, but also help you get the reward of learning. Kind of like when you finish a class and you feel that it was something that was rewarding for you, or probably because it was a very hard class, there's ways in which you can work out the method and the relation with the student in order to make this uh, something uh, that happens at scale. But that's not all. We have like the 2.0 version, which is neuroscience brain-based cluster system. And this is where things get a little bit more weird because this, first of all, this is gonna be a late future architecture. I think we're still far away from implementing these systems. But in essence, the idea is that, yes, you have like an individual tutor, but education is not something that you do on your own learning is also a social activity. So in order to make that happen, you can cluster people together with an individual tutor so that they're able to work together and interact within each other. So this is a still kind of like very experimental, but the idea here is that teachers not only are kind of like teaching, but they become kind of like an organization where they coordinate these tutors and they see where these different groups are standing. Now, that's a late future architecture coming back to present we are still conditionally optimistic on the future of AI. And by that means is there are some conditions for us to be optimistic. Uh, for example, government has its own policies in place. The Europe has its own AI data act, which is human, which has a more approach towards human rights and how data is handled for citizens of Europe. Uh, United States data collection policy has a own different essence of how data is collected, especially if minors are involved or students are involved. And then China has a different implementation of AI, which allows it to grow at a different scale. Uh, by that we mean is something as an individual you need to do is question yourself and ask, who am I comfortable sharing my data going forward? Because AI is gonna be staying for a long time here as part of your learning curves too. Are you comfortable sharing your data with the government? or startup enterprises, kind of like the trolley problem here. But even as a parent, if you have children who goes to school, 
you want to question that, like, are you comfortable sharing your child's data if that improves these learning models in the coming future? Because that's an important open-ended question you have to keep in mind going forward. Because this also affects the propaganda. These AI models right now are seen as black boxes because they are very easy to utilize and then they can affect the critical thoughts of students. And the places where these AI models are used, there are more chances that these classes, these certain classes, can propagate at scale. Uh, speaking of scale, talent will be an essential resource at scale because the countries with more resources to hire AI talent can scale those places and those regions, while those who cannot afford will actually lose out on those opportunities to invest in AI in their education in those regions. So that's another thing you might want to keep in point. To recap what we just said, because we are almost on time, what did you learn today? Well, AI is here to stay and to make our lives better, but with a couple of conditions. If you are a teacher uh, and setting up a learning module for your class or even an individual working on self-improvement or even a manager working on ways to improve the L&D of your reports, look at AI as a coach from the sports model and have a guardrail approach to it. Neuroscience has been here before and we have a good opportunity to plug AI in it and use it to our existing learning systems in the long run but keeping in mind all the policies that come with this, because whether it be at individual level, organization, or geographic, uh, we need to be very careful of how we handle data and, and our own privacy with it. Well, that is it for now, folks. If you have any questions, now is the time. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> That is a great question. Uh, I think one of the important things to consider here is that even with like all of the things we've seen and mentions of AI and developers and like there's going to be AI engineers and all of that, the reality is that in education, we're going to still need teachers and those spaces. I believe that there's a combination of like a lot of the questions that students were making were on an individual base. So they don't get to share that with like the rest of their class. But the other thing that to consider there is that they had a limit on the number of questions they were able to make. So they were, I think the cap was like three attempts or three questions. So it's hard to say specifically, and I think it's a great question. And like, I do believe that forums, these online forums, and this was implemented on an online class. So these online forums help to kind of like voting on like what is the common question and all of that. So I'm not super, I'm not super clear if it was based on like, hey, everyone having the same question or multiple different questions. So I'm, I'm not super certain about that. But it's a great question to think about. Of a lot of the reasons why people don't repeat the questions is because other people have made the question already. Uh, for the record, I'll just repeat the question uh, because it's recorded here. Yeah. Uh, the question was somewhere around uh, using AI improve the way students ask questions or improve the efficiency around it. But on more discussion more around like what kind of questions we are talking here. Is that right? It was about the number, the quantity of questions. Like if uh, it's repeated because they're making questions individually or right. or it's more because they make like different questions. Awesome. I think that's why the the way that you ask the questions is important because like if you use for example github compiler right now you're able to have like both like one that you ask a question and it kind of like responds 
It's also kind of like a, hey, this is, you can ask like, hey, give me a pathway to learn how to code Python. And it will give you like a, a template on like what you can, you can add there or what's the, the best path to learn, to learn Python. So right now I don't think there's like any super specific, but essentially I've seen both use cases on like students or from like students. Yeah, so the question is some students learn by statements and some by questions and whether we can find a balance between them. Uh, I think we can and something that I also talked is like asking the right questions can also be translated into asking the right statements to the AI and how, how the AI is designed. So CS50 AI is a really good example. Yesterday I was asking it about bubble sort. It gave me ways to like, hey, these are the way how you can create a bubble sort program. But I, when I asked it an out of scope question like, tell me how to deploy a Kubernetes cluster. It's like, nope, that's something out of the scope and we are not going to do that. And because of that guardrails, it kind of helps me uh, keep my focus on what I would really want to learn here and not just find my way out into something else. Thank you. Like role playing with the oh, yeah. So right now I don't can come up with a paper right now that I've read, but I know a couple of teams that are doing. So the question is if giving like an AI an, an LLM like a personality or kind of like some sort of role in in, in the learning uh, process helps them learn better than if it was just like whatever AI. Uh, I don't have a paper right now that comes to mind. Uh, I know a lot of, there's like a couple of companies that are doing AI education and gaming. Uh, so again, like from, from what we mentioned in the beginning is like there's still a lot of like papers are coming up or coming out. Uh, so I would keep an eye on them. But as far as I'm aware of, I haven't seen any any right now. I think a point, part of it also comes down like what's the personalization of an individual? What's the right level of personalization you want for them to understand and interact with the AI? And when you're talking about personalization or one-on-one -on -one tutoring with AI, the concern of data also comes in. So whether you're comfortable of how much data you're willing to share so that it can, the AI can be more personalized with you because that's when the geopolitical restriction comes in of how much United States allow and what we see in other countries might be more flexible uh, there's a research based on China where the tutoring system is slightly different because the, the data policies are different and they have a different level of personalization to 101 tutoring before uh, in terms of how AI coaching is looked at. So yeah, thank you. Do we have any more questions? One last question, yeah. Yeah, so we're talking about like when you're going to an interview, it's an, an AI that helps you prepare for interviews. So we actually removed the slide, but there's some initial research on metacognition, which has to do with how much you think you know about what you know. And it's kind of like a very hard thing to say, but essentially what this has helped and, and, and the way that this research team is working on it is uh, they are proving that AI can help you feel more confident about your own skills if it's used like a coach and you bounce ideas before going through like the real test. And this was very impactful because for developers, one of the most common things that developers have is imposter syndrome. And when you see that the most is like during job interviews. So if you're able to use AI as a coach 
that helps you kind of like under get more confident about your own skills, it helps them have better results when once they do the the real training or the the real test for for getting a job. So uh, there's a very there's a very small team doing metacognition and AI in education. Um, they're, they're still very early stages, so hopefully they'll they'll get something. I think by the end of the year. Metacognition. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you all. Uh, we'll be around at the GitHub booth or just like around the conference for today and tomorrow. If you have any other questions, and yeah, we'll see you around. Happy Open Source Summit. <laughs>